Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 10th webinar in the Cardiovascular Connections 2022 series. Today's webinar is titled Investigating a Novel Regulator of Atrial Contractility, featuring Dr. David Barefield, Assistant Professor of Cell and Molecular Physiology at Loyola University, Chicago. Today, he will give an in-depth discussion on his research investigating the role of the myosin binding protein H-like in atrial dysfunction. Before we get started, we would just like to acknowledge our partners at the American Physiological Society and the European Council for Cardiovascular Research. And in particular, I'd like to thank the session sponsor, Aurora Scientific, for helping to make this event possible. For nearly 20 years, Aurora Scientific has been at the forefront of cardiovascular mechanics research with their equipment used by many of the world's top researchers studying isolated heart tissue preparations, engineered constructs, and even skeletal muscle detriment in models of cardiovascular disease. Whether measuring force in cardiomyocytes or quantifying the mechanical properties of IPSC-derived car cardiac scaffolds, Aurora Scientific has the expertise and the instruments to support the most demanding of cardiac mechanics experiments. And now with that, I'd like to welcome Dave to the floor. Dave, please take it away whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you, Sydney. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. It's great to be able to share my work. Uh, it's been a little, bit, a little bit of time since I've seen everybody, so... Feel free to send me a message afterwards if you have any questions about what I'm presenting. And before I get started, um, because this is sponsored by the American Physiological Society, um, I do a little plug for AJP Heart and Circulation Circulatory Physiology. Uh, we currently have a call for papers on sarcomere cytoskeletal and, and mechanobiology research. Um, I am one of the guest editors. So please send us your research on these topics and we'll have a really great issue uh, put together. All right, so um, today I'm gonna be talking to you about my research, uh, mostly focusing on cardiomyocytes uh, and atrial function, uh, which is kind of an interesting combination of things. So my longstanding research interest has been in genetic cardiomyopathies, and these are traditionally um, caused by a primary pathogenic variant that takes a normal heart and then causes it to either dilate or hypertrophy. Um, as two sort of distinct etiologies among several others. What's interesting about this disease um, is that the penetrance of these mutations is not 100%. And family members can have varying degrees of, of severity of their illness um, and time of presentation. So what's become um, appreciated in recent years is that while you have a primary pathogenic variant, there are many other secondary modifiers that can be exacerbating um, the disease progression. Additionally, there's a bunch of other modifiers, um, environmental as well as the contributions of other organ functions, which uh, may be causing these um, diseases to be modified. And talking about primarily these two types of cardiomyopathy, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is uh, sort of been established as a disease of the sarcomere. So um, this is one um, illustration of a a crossbridge between a myosin thick filament and actin thin filament. And these are several of the players in cardiomyocyte um, contractile regulation. And in cardio and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, mutations in myosin binding protein C and um, myosin heavy chain are responsible for about 80% of, um, of HCM cases that have a genetic, uh, genetically defined cause. And generally, um, very generally, mutations that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, typically result in a gain of function and enhanced contractility. So this is a hypercontractile disease. In contrast, dilated cardiomyopathy um, has a variety of genetic causes. So mutations in genes that encode myofilament proteins, calcium handling um, proteins, metabolic uh, pathways, the nuclear membrane, the plasma membrane, uh, et cetera all have been linked to dilated cardiomyopathy in various ways. And these generally conspire to result in a hypocontractile weakened heart that dilates and progresses to failure. And interestingly, despite the large no number of genes that have been linked to dilated cardiomyopathy, I think some gene panels now have about hundred genes on it. Um, people who go for genetic testing for dilated cardiomyopathy with a clear familial inheritance pattern um, still only receive a genetic diagnosis about 50% of the time. So that means there's either interactions of many genes conspiring to cause this phenotype, 
or um, there are other genes that we have not identified that cause DCM. One other thing that I'll mention now that, that becomes apparent later in my talk is um, cardiomyopathy has also been traditionally viewed as a disease of the ventricle, which is appropriate because the ventricular function is um, sort of the most paramount in terms of uh, maintaining health. And um, however, one of the things that's been noticed is that um, atrial function also is affected fairly early in these diseases, um, and especially the development of atrial fibrillation occurs sort of with the onset of cardiomyopathy. This is from uh, the SHARE registry uh, cohort of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. And you can see that the age of onset um, of atrial fibrillation and the diagnosis of cardiomyopathy uh, match very well. So atria is also a muscle and is and contains the proteins that are typically mutated in, in hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathy. And so the, um, the contribution of these mutations to atrial dysfunction is not particularly well studied. And why do I bring that up, you may ask. So here, um, I'm going to talk to you a, lot, a little bit of the work I did as a postdoc in Beth McNally's lab at Northwestern University, um, and then kind of how my lab is taking this, um, this research into some new directions. Uh, so right when I started in Beth's lab in, in about 2015, she had finished uh, doing whole genome sequencing on one of these families that had had dilated cardiomyopathy, but no genetic cause was identified. Um, and uh, what she found was so in this proband, um, uh, number one on the second row, um, uh, this man had dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure, um, as well as a lot of arrhythmias. Here's um, a pacemaker test about six months before he passed away at 32, um, showing uh, the top panel, the normal function, then underneath um, the the rhythm with the pacemaker off, which is pretty pretty horrific. Um, and then even with the pacemaker on, he was exhibiting a lot of um, uh, PV PVCs and other ventricular arrhythmias. The mother of this family, um, one, two on top, uh, also had a, a history of atrial fibrillation. Uh, you can see on the top panel on the right, the, the atrial fibrillation that um, marked with the asterisk, as well as um, in this persisted, you know, after her, her pacemaker and AV node ablation. So this whole family had a high burden of conduction disease, um, and most of the children who were affected were born in um, an AV block of some, of some form. So this is an interesting um, cluster of symptoms for this disease, and with no genetic cause, it was difficult to understand what was going on. But after um, Dr. McNally and Meg Puckelwartz in her lab did whole genome sequencing, they found a variant in this gene, MYBPHL. And then um, I joined the lab and we looked into this. So MYBPHL had never previously been described in any capacity. Um, it had been sort of auto autonom automatically annotated um, as having homology to myosin binding protein H. So this is myosin binding protein H-like, which is not particularly fun, but is descriptive. And myosin binding protein H-like is highly related to a, a fairly well-studied protein, cardiac myosin binding protein C. So myosin binding protein C um, happened to be what I studied during my PhD in Sakti Savyapan's lab at Loyola. Uh, so kind of when I, when I joined Beth's lab and this, this came up, um, it seemed a little too good to be true, but I was interested, so I started studying this. And the stop in this variant we found in MYBPHL um, encoded a premature stop codon between these last, uh, before this last C terminal um, immunoglobulin domain in myosin binding protein H like. And previous studies um, for, of myosin binding protein C and myosin binding protein H have shown that these domains, these last C terminal domains, are, are absolutely necessary for the protein to incorporate into the myofilament and be stable and performance function. So we hypothesized that this was going to um, to cause the, the protein to basically become a null allele. And C protein mutations that are responsible for a large portion of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy all function this way, or 70% of them function this way, where a premature stop codon will um, cause no functional protein to be made or incorporate and um, end up with a bit of a null allele. So the first thing I did was to find out, you know, where was this expressed? Was it actually my filament protein? Uh, we looked at atria, um, and here's total soluble myofilament protein fractionations from atria. You see the C protein on the top of this Western blot, um, marking the myofilament fraction. 
and XNA6 is a membrane bound protein marking the soluble in the total. And then with an antibody we were able to buy commercially, uh, you could see myosin binding protein H like um, highly enriched in the myofilament fraction. The other thing I tried was I um, made a construct with this uh, R255 stop mutation um, and then a wild type MYBPHL and transfected them into neonatal mouse cardiomyocytes. And you can appreciate in this top panel of uh, this immunofluorescence um, image that you get nice uh, myofilament localization of this of this red signal um, between um, between the sarcomeres. And with the MYBPHL, there's no no localization um, that's discernible. In my lab now, my postdoc uh, Alex Alvarez Arce has been looking at all of the premature stop mutations in now MYBPHL. So there's a bunch of these described in the NOMAD database. And um, you know, we, there's really nothing known and nothing clinically annotated about MYBPHL. So we decided that we should go see if all of these function similarly. And what he has been doing is transfecting neonatal rat ventricular cardiomyocytes with um, either an RFP control or MYBPHL containing uh, the wild type sequence in the second column or um, all of these premature stop mutations. Um, including a few others that he's still working on. And what uh, the, the kind of overall um, takeaway, if you look at the correlation index on the right in the, in the figure, um, that wild type MYBPHL correlates very highly with um, myosin binding protein C localization. However, all of these premature stop variants um, don't correlate very well with myofilament localization, suggesting that they also are um, mislocalized and, and potentially act as um, as null alleles in this case. Oh, we're still working on a few experiments to, to definitively show that. When I when we originally found this mutation in this family, we were lucky that this family was very um, was very invested in helping um, us understand what was happening to them, and the affected parent and the unaffected parent were both able to, to provide um, some cell samples that we reprogrammed into IPS, IPS cells and then differentiated into cardiomyocytes. And you can see the, for the control, the G um, nucleotide is present at this location and in the heterozygous R255 stop, um, you see this G to A variant. We confirmed this with Sanger sequencing. So you can see both of the G and the A nucleotides present in the R255X hat. Um, but then when we took the RNA, made it cDNA and sequenced it, you actually only saw the transcript from the C allele suggesting that this, this may have been actually nonsense mediated decay um, and remo removed before it was even able to make a truncated protein, which is um, in, in accordance with literature on myosin binding protein C stop truncation mutations as well. Uh, also, it was very lucky that the, the Knockout Mouse Project had made an MYBPHL null mouse before we ever looked at this, and we were able to obtain this animal to study um, the effects of MYBPHL and saw that um, in the heterozygous and um, homozygous null alleles, the expression of the, of the transcript and the protein um, was abolished in the null, um, with potentially a stepwise reduction in the heterozygous, which I'll get into a little later. We also then went on to make a much better antibody recognizing this unique N-terminal domain of MYBPHL uh, and used it to confirm its localization. So here's a Western blot showing um, myosin in atria and ventricle uh, and then MYBPHL showing staining only in the atria. This correlates with the immunofluorescence figure um, on the right where the atria up top has a strong red signal in the MYBPHL staining um, and nothing in the ventricle. And then in the null mouse, there is no staining of MYBPHL. So this antibody is detecting what we think it's detecting and is doing it fairly well. Um, some Western bot uh, verification of this, um, that the MYBPHL is, is removed in the null um, compared to total myosin and total protein. Importantly, this mouse also had the uh, physiological phenotypes found in the family that we identified the, the mutation in. So this is um, echocardiography measurements uh, done on the uh, wild type heterozygous and MYPPHL null mouse. You can see the M mode traces on the, the left panel uh, shows normal function in the wild type um, and some decreased function in the heterozygous and the null, including um, 
slightly dilated left ventricular internal diameter, the LVID, in peak diastole uh, in both male and female mice, and then also a reduction in the percent fractional shortening, um, so a really reduction in systolic function, which is not um, which is significantly reduced and at a, a fairly reasonable percentage uh, deficit, uh, but not um, as kind of uh, horrifyingly reduced as some models of dilated cardiomyopathy are. So this is a mild um, insult, but still um, definitely present in these animals. The heart weight body weight wasn't changed overall, um, that ratio. However, the atrial weight to the total heart weight was significantly elevated in the heterozygous and the null mice, suggesting that the atria were um, dilated or hypertrophied. We confirmed this with uh, mouse uh, cardiac MRI and showed that the right atria the right atrium uh, was significantly um, larger in the MYBPHL null mice than the wild type, and uh, potentially a trend towards that as well for the left atrial volume, um, but that was not uh, did not achieve statistical significance. We also were able to recapitulate a number of the electrophysiological findings in these animals. Uh, here are some in some conscious ambulatory telemetry measurements. Um, from these mice after isoproteranol administration. As you can see in the ECG traces on the top, the wild type animals have a high heart rate, but um, fairly normal rhythm and, and unremarkable. The heterozygous uh, in this case had um, a, high a high proportion of uh, PVCs, um, so premature ventricular contractions in this, in this uh, tracing. And then this, null, this trace on the bottom that's from the null animal with isoproteranol shows um, uh, atrioventricular um, conduction defects. So you have a lot of missed QRSs, as well as uh, kind of some frightening pauses and periods of asystole um, in here. So these mice had arrhythmic events as well. And we were then able to further go on. Um, and after treating with propranolol, uh, we're able to finally unmask this actual um, AV block phenotype that was such a uh, prevalent hallmark in the family. So here you can see wild type uh, traces plus propranolol. The P waves are marked with these red red dashes. And then in the null mice with propranolol, you can see that the P waves are still fairly regular, but they're completely um, unrelated to the QRS complexes that, um, that follow them. So these mice are in total AV block. The Poincaré plots underneath show the RR variability so the heart rate variability um, in these tracings and the wild type have fairly tight um, invariable heart rate, whereas the null shows a considerable scattering of the heart rate um, over these periods. Looking at um, quantifying some of the, 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 um, the aspects of the ECGs, we also were able to see that the MYBPHL null mice had a significantly prolonged P wave duration, so you, which um, fits with the atrial dilation um, and other atrial dysfunction we were able to find. Now, um, what was interesting is after we published um, our first study and wondering why nobody had noticed this before, that, that MYBPHL was a thing and if it caused disease, there was a few other publications that piqued our interest, and one of them was this um, GWAS uh, meta-analysis of um, about 100,000 European descent uh, individuals with PR prolongation, and MYBPHL did come out as one of the, um, the GWAS hits on that for PR prolongation. So this made us feel a little bit more confident that what we were seeing was was real and maybe affecting um, a, a broader um, swath of, of people. So. Coming on to this next part. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ventricular conduction system now because, well, we did see that MYBPHL was highly enriched in the atrium. Um, the, we did also notice um, bits of H-like staining in the ventricles. So the cardiac conduction system is composed of specialized cardiomyocytes. Um, it starts in the um, right atrium, and then there are a few tracks within the atrium that propagate signal across the atria, and then the AV node, followed by the Hiss bundles, and then the Purkinje fibers. These all contract. They all have sarcomeres, and their contractile function is sort of um, has not been very well studied, uh, and, and hasn't there's not been a ton of relevance that's been ascribed to it. 
So we were sort of interested that when we saw these ventricular arrhythmias, um, how this atrial protein was contributing to them. So I sectioned some mouse hearts and did some immunofluorescence staining to identify where MYVPHL was being expressed. And you can see it pretty clearly in this first column in the atria, um, in the left atrium there. And then if you zoom in um, on this other little red uh, dot towards the left of the, um, the left column, we've also counterstained with contactin-2 and contactin-2 stains for ventricular conduction system cells. So it's, a, it's expressed fairly specifically in the AV node, the hispondyls, and the Purkinje fibers. And there's a nice portion here um, in the second column where you can see the H-like staining in the atria coming into the ventricle. So there's some areas where there's not co-staining, and then there's areas where there are co-staining, and then areas um, below it where the, con the contactin to ventricular conduction system cells propagate then down into the rest of the heart. And looking at the Purkinje fibers in column three, we were able to find um, several Purkinje cells that expressed MYBPHL within them. So here's one of them in, in column three. And that seemed like a fairly clear um, function that maybe MYBPHL is expressed in, in Purkinje cells, but it's unfortunately not expressed in all of them. And then if you look at column four, we also found many cardiomyocytes that were not associated with the conduction system, um, like this one on the um, right ventricular free wall. And this confounded our interpretation uh, a bit, and this is still something we're, we're working on figuring out. I also isolated the, the total ventricular cardiomyocytes from um, MYBPHL wild type and heterozygous mice to see whether they had a different morphology than um, normal ventricular cardiomyocytes. So here you see the, the red uh, and orange co-stained MYBPHL positive ventricular cardiomyocytes and they show a range of morphologies. You see ones that are mononuclear and smaller, uh, like Purkinje cells typically are, or highly, highly branched, um, or then some that look like large working ventricular cardiomyocytes. And looking at the, um, the cardiomyocyte width length and width, ra length width, width ratio, um, I did not notice any significant changes in the morphology, suggesting that um, H like is expressed in a variety of ventricular cardiomyocytes, not just in the conduction system cells. However, when I counted all of these um, and then confirmed this by counting um, MYBPHL um, loci in section tissue, the MYBPHL heterozygous hearts had significantly fewer MYBPHL positive ventricular cardiomyocytes. Um, so this indicates that the um, well, some cells are still able to arise and express MYBPHL um, sufficiently with one allele. Uh, for some reason, the amount of total cells that do this is reduced. And this may be a developmental um, hallmark, um, but that's an ongoing project. And finally, to sort of understand how MYBPHL is localized in the heart um, and what this can tell us about its function, I was able to use uh, light sheet microscopy in optically cleared perinatal day five mouse hearts uh, from wild type heterozygous and MYBPHL null mice. Here you can see nice staining in red of the atria um, on the top and then contactin two staining the ventricular conduction system. Uh, so you see the, L the left ventricle and the right ventricle internal chambers uh, very nicely outlined. Using um, the Ameris software, I was able to make 3D renderings of all of these and uh, use them to, to computationally evaluate the localization. Now, one thing you might, it's a bit harder to see um, in the right image, uh, but in addition to the very bright red atria, um, there are dots scattered throughout the ventricle. So what I did was I quantified how far away those ventricular um, signals were from the conduction system. Here uh, again is this in a few different um, angles. And importantly, if you look at the histogram um, in panel B, you can appreciate that in the wild type um, mice with, in the black bars, the distant, the, um, the spots, the distance of the spots from the contactin to surface um, are enriched within about 50 to 100 um, microns from the conduction system. So this shows you that they are either within it or you know one or two cells away from it. Whereas the heterozygous and the null um, signals are more evenly distributed 
uh, with a peak around 250 microns that correlates to sort of the epicardial surface. Um, so this is kind of an imaging artifact where um, the, the difference between the inside of the heart and the outside of the heart gets picked up as a signal um, where that is just kind of showing nonspecific binding. So, and this is quantified again in CND, showing the mean spot distance to the surface, um, and then the number, the percentage of all of the red stained spots in the ventricle that are within 100 microns of uh, the ventricular conduction system. So, H like definitely seems to be associated with or um, close to the ventricular conduction system, which may place it in a position to mediate some of the ventricular conduction system defects that we identified. Another interesting branch of research that's been uh, developing is um, single cell sequ RNA sequencing on cardiomyocytes. And this is a paper from uh, Sean Wu's lab uh, a few years ago. And they did this nice experiment where they dissected cells from the AV node, um, the SA node, and then Purkinje fibers, did single cell RNA-seq -seq, uh, RNA -seq on them, and then clustered them and kind of defined them by their expression patterns. And what you can appreciate from this is that um, there's a lot of variability in these, um, these clustering plots. And some of these cells in the ventricular um, conduction system, uh, or sorry, the ventricular cardiomyocytes show an intermediate phenotype between um, the conduction system and a kind of working cardiomyocyte, uh, suggesting that this is kind of an, one of these transition zones. Um, of cardiomyocyte that that exists between the Purkinje fibers and the the bulk myocardium, so this provides a um, an interesting tool to look at some of the variability in gene expression that defines the function of some of these of these cells. So obviously, this is a myofilament protein allegedly. So we wanted to see whether that was true. Um, a little bit of sarcomere nomenclature. Uh, for, for all of you. So here is an immuno, uh, or sorry, an electron, electron micrograph of um, striated muscle. The sarcomere is, is from one Z disk to another Z disk. The A band is um, the thick filament, and that goes, that's, includes the, uh, the myosin thick filament and where all the myosin binding protein C is localized. Um, the I band is uh, a variable length and includes actin filaments um, where there are no myosin filaments. And then the H band in the middle um, is uh, a lighter band where there are no myosin heads and no actin overlap. And then the M band in the middle is the is the sort of the middle um, central structure that, that helps hold components of the myofilament together. And the uh, interesting thing is the, um, the H zone here is um, from the German word meaning heller, which means lighter, because you can see this, this lightening pattern there. And the C protein is found in the A band in a subsection of it, and it's called the C zone because it has C protein in it. And the C protein was named in the um, 70s, and this was then retroactively applied to the sarcomere. But as you'll see in a minute, the H-like and H protein seems to occur in the H band. Um, but this is a um, kind of fortuitous accident of nomenclature. So we'll go on to this next bit. So here is how myosin binding protein C binds to the sarcomere. So this is one half sarcomere from the M line on the right to the Z disc on the left. You have all of these all of these myosin um, heads arranged in repeats that are 43 nanometers thick, and there are about nine to 11 myosin binding protein C um, binding sites um, along the C in the C zone, and every one of these myosin repeats combined three myosin binding protein C molecules. So there's 27 molecules per half sarcomere. And this is a very well-defined um, stoichiometry of the protein. So because myosin binding protein H-like had these myosin binding domains that were highly similar to C protein, we thought it would be a good place to start looking, see whether it bound to the, the C zone of the A band. So staining with um, alpha actinin to mark the Z disks, um, and then myosin binding protein H, like we do see these nice A band doublets between the Z disks um, in both the wild type and the heterozygous um, MYPPHL mice. And then when um, so 
there we go. And then when we co-stained with myosin binding protein C, um, you can see that both of these overlap very nicely um, on either side of the M line. One of the other things that becomes quite apparent is that the MYBPHL occupies additional space closer to the M line than the C protein does. So we quantified, um, quantified this by looking at the, um, the intensity traces of the fluorescence of these uh, super resolution structured illumination microscopy images. And how we quantified this was looking at this doublet of um, these myosin binding proteins and then measuring the, the peak separation at 50% of the peak intensity um, compared to the nadir of the M line. And what you can see is this is the doublet separation across the M line. The C protein is about um, 350 micro, uh, nanometers wide, whereas the um, H like is about um, 300. So this is obviously um, beyond the resolution of light microscopy, but these averages do hold up and correlate very nicely to the um, the um, I mean, the electron micrographs that have been previously um, reported. Uh, so here's an immuno electron micrograph from um, soleus muscle uh, taken um, by Pauline Bennett. And this shows nicely um, the vertical stripes in the A band are the C protein molecules in this inner two thirds region that is the C zone. And then in uh, rabbit psoas muscle, myosin binding protein H had been previously identified as only binding to this medial section. So you see this one very bright stripe um, on either side of the M line of, uh, of MYBPH. So here that correlates nicely with um, our image showing that MYBPH L seems to be able to bind um, preferentially closer to the M line. we did want to discuss to identify the relationship between H like and C protein. So because the amount of myosin binding protein C is very well conserved in the sarcomere um, and there are no other binding sites for it, we tested the hypothesis of whether myosin binding protein H like bound to different sites or competed for the same sites uh, with C protein. So this is just a, um, this is a Western blot for um, um, wild type mouse. So if you look at the atria in the ventricle um, with total myosin content. And then if you look at the myosin binding protein C, you can appreciate that in the atria, there's about half as much C protein is in the ventricle. Now this is kind of remarkable and um, is surprising that this hasn't been identified before, but what I've learned from this project is a lot of people don't look at the atria um, and this is kind of a good, a good uh, illustration of, uh, of how different this looks um, and, and is an interesting observation compared to then the MYBPHL, which is only present in the atria versus the ventricle. So this is also true in human tissue, um, albeit in a slightly sadder looking Western blot, but um, the H-like is only present in the atria and shows um, about half as much myosin binding protein C in the atria compared to the ventricle. So this would um, kind of, this kind of indicated to us that there may be some competition going on and that these proteins might be binding to the same sites and competing with each other. So to further assess that, we looked at the protein levels um, of, of these two myosin binding proteins in the myosin binding protein H like null mouse on the left. Uh, so here again, you have a total myosin uh, that was used to normalize the myosin, myofilament content and the myosin binding protein C underneath it. And in the wild type in the heterozygous, you can see a, a lower level and then a lot more myosin binding protein C in the, in the MYBPHL null mouse. And the MYBPHL shows normal levels in the wild type and uh, potentially slightly reduced levels in the heterozygous, although this is um, quite noisy and was not statistically significant, versus uh, total absence of the protein in the MYBPHL null um, um, parts. Also looking at the inverse of this experiment, looking at total atrial protein from mouse models of uh, myosin binding protein C, uh, we have non-transgenic controls that express a normal amount of myosin uh, binding protein C. We have the MYBPC3 uh, TT mouse, which is a truncating mutation that doesn't um, produce any functional protein. Um, and you can see that there's an absence of myosin binding protein C here. And then the MYBPC3 TT wild type transgenic mouse, which is that same null mouse, that same TT null mouse um, with a wild type transgene that overexpresses um, myosin binding protein C. 
Now, normally you can't overexpress myosin binding protein C because there's only 27 sites for it per half sarcomere. But in this case, you do see that there is more myosin binding protein C present um, in this transgenic than there is the control, uh, indicating that it's able to increase its occupancy somehow. And it looks like it does that by decreasing the amount of myosin binding protein H like um, in the bottom panel. So you see the inverse where um, there's about twice as much H like in the myosin binding protein C null. And then when you overexpress myosin binding protein C, H like um, decreases concomitantly. Because the stoichiometry is so well preserved, um, we went and tried to quantify this uh, a little bit more accurately. So with the help of Mike Previs at University of Vermont, um, we were able to do some SBEC and he normalized the levels of myosin binding protein H like and C to total myosin and was able to kind of define this as the number, the molecules, the myosin binding protein molecules per half sarcomere. So here, um, remember I mentioned that there's 27 myosin binding protein C molecules per half sarcomere in the ventricle. Um, you can see here there's about 14 in the wild type of the H-like, as well as about 14 of the wild of the C protein in the wild type. And then in the myosin binding protein H-like heterozygous, there's um, there's fewer H-like molecules um, and a proportional increase in the number of molecules of C protein. And then in the H-like null, there's um, in fact doubling of the MYPP um, C molecules to about 27 molecules, perhaps sarcomere. So this um, provides a lot of evidence that these two proteins are actually competing for the same binding sites and maintaining um, the quantized stoichiometry. And we got this scheme on the right, just kind of illustrate this, that myosin binding protein H-like probably binds to this medial site exclusively um, with a higher affinity. Um, but then in the remainder of, the, of these nine binding stripes, um, they bind um, in some yet to be defined pattern, but at approximate equal affinity. And then the, re the removal of one of the myosin binding proteins allows for the complete replacement with the other. To also show this um, more acutely, my graduate student, Kelly Araujo, did some interesting experiments using neonatal rat ventricular cardiomyocytes, uh, where she expressed MYBPHL um, and looked then at the ratio of myosin binding protein C in the transfected cells to the non-transfected cells. So there's a little bit of an interesting trick we were able to, to um, capitalize on here where the um, myosin binding protein H-like antibody we developed has a very consistent off-target nuclear staining. So in this, um, this four panel figure in the top left, you can see the nucleus um, in this RFB transfected um, cardiomyocyte. And in the top right, you can see it's a bit fainter, but the um, nucleus that's stained with this MYBPHL antibody. Now, clearly one of these cells is transfected with MYBPHL and the other is not. So what we ended up doing was taking the ratio of the fluorescence intensity of the H-like positive um, cell to the nucleus uh, for the H-like, and then the ratio of the C protein signal from the H-like positive cell to the H-like negative cell. And when we graph these as XY values, we were able to show a, um, a very nice correlation um, where if you look at this um, graph, where uh, one zero on the X-axis would represent MYBPHL staining that is, that's no greater than the nucleus. But as that increases with more H-like signal, the amount of C protein, um, the C protein ratio from the H-like transfected to the non-transfected cell um, is reduced. So this was a nice kind of acute experiment showing that these, this computation happens dynamically. And this was about a day after transfection. To define um, that medial binding site of MYBPHL, we also then collaborated with Hank Renzier's lab at University of Arizona, um, who has done some fantastic work um, doing immuno-EM on uh, Titan and other myofilament proteins in recent years. Here is an immuno-EM of uh, wild-type mouse atria stained with a Titan um, I103 antibody that defines the IA junction of the myofilament. Um, as well as our MYBPHL antibody. So we have this um, we have this dense staining of MYBPHL in around in the C zone of the sarcomere. Um, they, there's some quantification up here showing um, quantifying the shrinkage of the sample um, and, and calibrating it. And then um, here, just looking at the mouse um, 
MYBPHL. We don't see the clear stripes that were, were visible in the previous work from uh, Pauline Bennett and others. But what we did see was an enriched um, binding at the medial residues that are 30, that are 322 nanometers apart, which is the known distance between the third myosin repeat. Um, and then we were able to quantify the width of the MYBPHL staining, and it correlated nicely with C-zone staining in general. Um, this is the value. So we were able to count to calculate. Um, we were able to calculate this at you know 322 nanometers from from peak to peak, which is um, you know, 320 nanometers was what was reported in this work by Pauline Bennett, um, suggesting that H like and H are binding to the same third myosin stripe in the sarcomere. Um, and then. Interest of time, I skipped this one. So we were able to find that they do bind to every other, um, every third myosin crown. And importantly, what functional effect does all of this have? So the role of displacing, or the, the functional effect of displacing about half of the myosin binding protein C is sort of unclear. And um, to assess this, I did some single cell force calcium measurements. So looking at just wild type atrial and ventricle, um, using uh, permeabilized cardiomyocytes attached to a link controller and a force transducer. Um, I was able to um, administer higher do increasing doses of calcium and what recording the force generated. Um, and I didn't see any significant differences between the atrium and the ventricle when normalized to cross-sectional area. But um, I, there was a small um, um, shift in the calcium affinity in that the atria were more sensitive to calcium than the ventricle. Now, looking at the MYBPHL atria between wild type and null, um, I did not see any significant difference in the maximal force um, and didn't see any difference in the calcium affinity. So it was peculiar why this would be causing any disease. Um, however, a lot of the work on myosin binding protein C has illustrated that myosin binding protein C affects the rate of force development uh, and some of the other kinetic um, values of myofilament uh, contractility. So we collaborated with Casey Wolf at um, the University of Colorado, and she performed single single myofibril analysis on our samples. So if you haven't um, seen these experiments, what is done is um, single myofibrils are extracted from cardiomyocytes um, and, and permeabilized, so their sarcomeres are free to um, interact with the, the conditions of the bath. And they're perfused with a an, an, an inactivating calcium solution um, at low calcium, and then a maximally activating calcium solution. Um, and a few things can be measured with this. So immediately, you can measure the maximum tension generated, uh, as well as the rate of um, activation, which is that first exponential rise, the rate of tension redevelopment, which is the rise after that uh, that break in the middle of the high calcium phase, and then also the relaxation. So. Our MYBPHL null cardiomyocytes didn't have any differences um, in these parameters. However, uh, when we went and looked at the relaxation phase, we actually did see a significant alteration in the slow linear phase of relaxation. Um, so this is a zoom in of this of this relaxation phase after the, the low calcium solution has been put on it. And what you can appreciate is there's two phases. There's this linear phase that's marked by these uh, black and blue uh, lines, and then an exponential phase. And the linear phase is um, dictated by the off rate of myosin heads from the, um, from the actin thin filament. So basically the rate that the cross bridges um, um, are, are, are removed. And the MYBPHL null atrial myofibrils have a significantly shorter, significantly faster off rate. Uh, so in, in this um, relative uh, in this linear um, relaxation phase, whereas the exponential phase um, is not is not significantly different between these groups. So this provides a bit of information that we're following up on now um, with, with ongoing collaborations with with Casey and a few other models um, to determine how removal of H-like and then doubling of C protein in the atria. Um, would cause this to happen, and then what functional effects um, that would contribute to down the road. And then kind of quickly um, heading towards the end of this. So um, we've shown that h like is associated with this dysfunction. Um, it's expressed in the atria and in some parts of the ventricle. 
It uh, maintains a strict stoichiometry with C protein. And um, all of this is sort of shown that it may actually be a, a disease gene that's, that's interesting to study. So as I've been starting my own lab, um, I've been and studying an atrial myofilament protein, I've been frustrated with the sort of lack of um, information and literature out there on, on atrial contractility and atrial function in general, um, especially considering um, the contractile function of in atrial fibrillation uh, can definitely definitely um, modify the disease course of atrial fibrillation as well as cardiomyopathies. And atrial fibrillation is uh, the most prevalent arrhythmia in the, in the world, um, and it's highly age dependent. So uh, the, the amount of people with atrial fibrillation increased very steeply with age. Um, and to study this, um, obviously people have a very um, heterogeneous um, atrial fibrillation, whereas we then went to go take a look at a, a nice model of atrial uh, fibrillation in a canine model that was rapidly atrial paced, atrially paced with, um, and this is in collaboration with Rishi Aurora at uh, Northwestern. So here are some traces for this, uh, pre-pacing and normal sinus rhythm, tacky pacing um, for several weeks until these dogs are in uh, sustained AFib. Uh, the hearts are then harvested, and then we were able to permeabilize parts of the uh, myocardium and the atria and measure the contractile and biophysical functions of this. So here um, are control and AF, um, cardiomyocytes, and as we passively stretch them to longer and longer sarcomere lengths, we notice that the control um, cardiomyocytes are stiffer, whereas the AFib ones are more compliant. Uh, what we were able to look at was Titan isoforms, and while the isoforms of the long form and the short form of Titan weren't different in the atrial fibrillation samples, what we did notice was the atrial fibrillation samples had a higher proportion of degraded Titan, um, which is known to happen in stressful conditions. So the atria are then more dispensable and potentially more likely to dilate. Um, another thing we did was looking at the force calcium relationship um, as we did before and saw that the maximum force was decreased in the atrial fibrillation samples. Uh, my grad student, Hannah Sazaskis, um, then looked at the myosin isoform content and saw that, um, well, atrial, a canine atria usually have about 45% uh, beta myosin heavy chain. Um, this percentage was reduced in the AF samples, so they have more alpha myosin heavy chain, um, which uh, may help explain the increase or the, the reduction in isometric force. So we also looked at the increase in calcium sensitivity of force development and noticed a significant um, uh, desensitization in the atrial fibrillation um, samples. Sorry, yes, yeah, desensitization in the atrial fibrillation samples. Um, and then Hannah uh, performs a mass spec analysis and noticed a few pathways that were sort of interesting to this and we're still parsing through this data but in general um, atrial fibrillation samples showed a reduction in cardiac contractility proteins calcium channel proteins cell adhesion and uh, protein and mrna degradation pathways whereas um, there was an increase in cytoskeleton and metabolic apoptose apoptotic proteins um, as well as a few others so with that, I'll finish up and leave some time for questions. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in my lab, uh, my grad students, postdocs, and technicians, um, Jonathan Kirk for his help in, at Loyola, my collaborators and former lab mates at Northwestern, um, uh, other collaborators that worked on this project, and then um, the funding sources that we used uh, to perform these experiments. And uh, with that, um, I will take any questions. Let's jump into our first question. Thank you so much again for that. Um very in-depth presentation. Okay, is the MYBPHL expressed in the SA or AB node and what ion channels are altered? Yeah, so it's expressed as far, um, it's expressed in both. Um, it's hard to tell if it's expressed in all of the AV node or not. Um, it has a few, like it's a larger area um, and we haven't been able to co-stain with anything that's demarcating the AV node specifically, um, but it is present in that geographical location and um, some of the functional evidence would suggest that it, it, it is. In that RNA-seq data set I mentioned from single cell dissociations um, of the AV node uh, and SA node, there are cells in there that express MYBPHL. What we're currently doing uh, in response to the second part of the question the ionic channels that are altered are are unknown and 
partially because we are unable to then pull out which cells are H-like positive from the AV node. So we know all the atrial cardiomyocytes are, but we don't know if all of the AV node cells are, and certainly not all of the ventricular ones are. So we're working on a reporter that will let us identify um, in you know, dissociated cells which cells are expressing H-like, and then we can assess that with um, electrophysiology and also hopefully some single cell RNA-seq to define like what are those cell types that are H-like positive and what other um, genes are kind of co-regulated with them. Okay, great, great response, thanks. Um, our next question asks, when the P and QRS have no fixed relationship, um, have you identified it as AV disassociation or uh, complete AV block, so third degree ABB? Yeah, and then that one, and then the um, follow-up question about um, about that. So we have not um, identified. We have not been able to distinguish those two from the traces that we've had. Um, the family that had these, this mutation um, did have true like third degree AV block. Um, obviously, mice are physiologically much different um, in their electrophysiology, so we aren't sure yet, but we're working on identifying that now. Okay, great. Um, Guy asks, does the MYBPHL alter sarcomere length at rest and T-tubule structure? That's a good question. So um, the the resting sarcomere length in our null mice um, our, our null atrial cardiomyocytes has not been has not been significantly different. Um, atrial T tubule structure is a little less ordered than ventricular T tubule structure. We had performed some calcium transients on on isolated atrial cardiomyocytes, um, and what we did see was that there seemed to be a lot more disorder in like the localization of ryanine receptor clusters. Um, so there is some membrane dissociate uh, membrane um, impairments that are causing altered EC coupling but the actual um, geometry and um, morphology of all of the T tubules we haven't worked out yet okay great um, Audrey asks whether you've looked at the myBPC phosphorylations in your model yeah so um, in it's kind of interesting in the um, in the atria of the MYBPHL null mice, there's twice as much C protein, um, and all of it is fairly highly phosphorylated. So the issue with this is that mouse C protein is typically fairly highly phosphorylated, um, and so it's not it hasn't shown much of a difference. But phosphorylated C protein does have a bunch of activating effects on cross bridge formation. So having more phosphorylated myosin binding protein C in the atria actually is quite consistent with um, the changes in the relaxation parameters we found, uh, but we're working on kind of parsing out that more uh, mechanistically. Okay, fantastic. Um, I think we have time for one or two more. Um, sure. So Daniel asks, well, he, they state very nice talk. Um, they're wondering if you also looked at the AP characteristics in the MYBPHL model, atrial versus ventricular differences. Yeah, we have not done that yet. That's that's something we're interested in doing and have a, a good electrophysiological collaboration that we can hopefully uh, get those recordings from soon. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, another question, it would be interesting to look at atrial myosin RLC phosphorylation in your model. We know atrial R RLC gets dephosphorylated extremely slowly. I wonder if in your knockout model, how the baseline atrial RLC phosphorylation is affected. That's a really good point. And one of the interesting kind of confounding things with looking at atrial myofilament function is that there are a bunch of different isoforms in the atria. Um, and then the, the RLC function um, itself is a bit different. We have not looked at that yet. Um, I would very much like to. If you have any suggestions in to how to do that efficiently, uh, please send me an email and we can talk about that. Okay, very great. Um, all right, let's 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 do this last question. Uh, do changes in the MYBPHL alter also the electrical properties of myocytes? Um, yeah, we're not, so uh, we aren't totally sure yet. 
um, it's it's hard to tell. They're not morphologically much different, so some of the some of the aspects of them might be um, unaltered. Some of the data we've looked at for some ion channels do sh do show that they express some different ion channels, so I would expect it to be altered, but we haven't um, we haven't established that yet. <laughs> More avenues to explore. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank you so much, Dave, for being here with us today and for your awesome um, presentation and sharing your exciting findings. It was really a pleasure. Thanks so much. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming in and watching. And hopefully I'll see you all around soon. Great. Thanks. All right. And a big thanks also to the audience for participating. In closing, we hope you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar sponsored by Aurora Scientific and produced in partnership with the American Physiological Society and the European Council for Cardiovascular Research. And we look forward to having you with us again soon.